Welcome to Nappy's More Right Writer podcast. I'm Beth Stanton, Director of Publications and Editor for Nappy. This is The Writers Behind the Stories, a bi-monthly series where we meet some of the authors who write for Nappy's Mentor Magazine. Today's guest is Robert V. Mader, rhymes with Darth Vader, aka Bob. Bob has been the NAF- on the Nappy Board of Directors for 15 years and served as board chair for a decade. He is still active on the Nappy Board and serves on multiple industry committees. Bob has been flying for 30 years and is a CFI, CFII, MEI, and has amassed 6,500 hours of flight time, much of it as an instructor. Bob had a 40-year career with a major rail carrier and retired as director of safety. His greatest passion is aviation risk management. Bob's experience in both flight instruction and operations for rail carriers has led to his establishing one of the first enterprise-wide UAS drone programs. This included managing a fleet of more than 300 aircraft and training and supervising more than 200 Part 107 drone pilots. People like to tease Bob that his life seems like trains, planes, and automobiles. He says that cars are only a way to get to the airport. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Beth. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Well, before we jump in with you, Bob, I would like to tell our NAPI members the first time I ever came across a piece that you had written. Before I took my position as editor of NAFI, the prior editor, David Hipschman, sent me home on an airplane with a whole bunch of mentor magazines to read, to see if I wanted to join this organization as mentor. And one of the first things I read was the bi-monthly position report that the board chair writes for each issue. And this guy, Bob, wrote this. And I read this and I was like, damn, this guy's a good writer. I really, I think he's really good. And so I took over as director of publications, just as you were making your exit as board chair. So we, our paths never inter, inter, intersected from you writing a bi-monthly report for mentor. And by the way, NAFI members, I'm sure as you're aware, every single week, e-mentor newsletter, the board chair writes a short article in that as well. So for 10 years, Bob wrote 50 weeks a year because we don't do the week of air venture and the week of a sun and fun. We don't do e-mentor those two weeks. So Bob wrote 50 articles for e-mentor and he wrote six. Well, I guess if we do six times 10, my math is correct. He wrote 60 position reports. That's a lot of writing. And I just want to let you guys know when you have a monthly or a weekly deadline for creating content, it's a lot. It is a lot as Karen Kalashek, our current board chair will attest to. So Bob, you used to write very, very regularly for NAFI publications. Now you've also written articles here and there for Mentor. And I know what a great writer you are. So soon after I came on board as Nafi's editor, I kind of started hounding you to potentially write articles for the magazine. So tell me a little bit about what it was like for you to shift from weekly and bi-monthly constantly writing content to having this freedom uh, to whether maybe or maybe not write. Wow, I uh, hadn't I hadn't thought about that till you just asked. Um, I will tell you, it was it 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 kind of was like Wiley e. Coyote going off the cliff. You know, my feet were uh, still running, but uh, nothing. You know, I was just hanging in space, so to speak, until I looked down. Um, you know, gravity can. And Looney Tunes doesn't work until you look down. You know that, right? Right. So the uh, so there's that. Or in, a, in aviation terms, it was kind of like an approach stall. You know, kind of a soft, you know, kind of a drop out from underneath and realizing that I don't have to write every week. And that left me, I'll be honest, that left me a little, um, 
a little uh, at loose ends because I was so used to the. I gotta get. I gotta say, think of something intelligent to, to say this week for all these people. Um, it, not just our membership, but I, it, also being aware that uh, eMentor and the magazine went out to the industry as a whole, and I was representing uh, Nappy to the world. And the last thing I wanted to do is have the organization look bad because I said something incredibly stupid uh, or crass or offensive or something like that. Um, so uh, it was kind of strange that that those first few months. And uh, I took some time off and there was also a bit of a writer's block. Uh, I, I think you mentioned you wanted to talk about. Uh, there was a bit of writer's block on the other side of that. Uh, that uh, impeded the writing process uh, to the point where you and some good friends in the industry said, when are you going to start writing again, Bob? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. And listeners, this is going to be a little bit different of a Writers Behind the Story podcast episode, because Bob and I are going to get into a little bit more perhaps maybe personal or more vulnerable topics here because these are things that you as a NAFI member who is considering potentially writing for Mentor Magazine may be sharing some of these same feelings. So this is sort of like, hey, we're feeling this, you might be feeling this too, and I think it's good to talk about it. When you are a writer... And I know a lot of people who decide to submit content to mentor claim they're not writers. If you are literally putting words on paper or your computer, you're, you're a writer. If you are writing, you are a writer. So just own that part. Just be okay with that. But there's this, all this, all of this emotion around writing, not writing, fear, procrastination, imposter syndrome, you know, sort of, I'm not a writer, is a version of imposter syndrome. And if you are a type A perfectionist, maybe, I'm guessing maybe if <laughs> you can raise their hands and say that. Yeah. Being a type A perfectionist is, it's terrifying to put your work out in the world. Because when you show up and you put your thoughts, your mind on paper, uh, or out into the digital universe, you open yourself up to critique, to criticism, um, you know, fears of failure, I sucked, this is no good, you, you know, all that self-talk that we have. So, and, and Bob, we, we decided we were going to talk about this. So I started like literally twisting Bob's arm, like really hard, like, dude, you know, let's, let's write. And he was like, oh, I don't know. So, you know, you're admitting you had that sort of imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. And um, so I want to just talk about, so example, we're going to talk about Bob wrote the cover story for the September, October issue, 20, so September, October 23 issue of Mentor. Now this story, you guys see just how this process works at AirVenture 2022. Bob approached me with this amazing story. He says, Beth, this, oh my God, this happened. I said, Bob, this would be a great article for Mentor. Now, up to this point, I'd been twisting Bob's arm and he was kind of not budging too much. So when he came to me with this story, I'm like, dude, you need to write this for Mentor. Well, a year later, <laughs> it happened. Now, and, and again, there's no shame here, you guys. So uh, Bob, I would like you to share with our members. This is a very powerful story. I would like you to share with your members, with our members, you know, do you remember when you came to me and talked about this story and how you, you were so excited and lit up and you're like, Beth, oh my God. So, uh, and why was it so impactful? And why did you want to write that story? And tell us a little bit about the process from that moment at AirVenture 2022 sure. till now. How did that happen? Okay. Um, I suppose since the magazine's out, there's no uh, worrying about uh, the spo spoiler alert here, right? Um, I uh, the very shortest synopsis of the article is I trained a young man in 2016 or thereabouts uh, or earlier. He got most of, most of his private with me uh, because of uh, a 141 school situation. I didn't finish it, and then he got his instrument with me. And it, while he was at the University of Nebraska Omaha, he 
wound up joining the Marine Corps and became an, it was accepted as an aviator. Uh, you know, good, you know, good luck, congratulations, Marine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he went off <clears throat> um, because of DOD re uh, restrictions and so on. He, when he went overseas, I kind of lost track of them. They, they're not allowed, you know, because of the issues of Facebook and terrorism and all that other stuff and, and protecting their families, kind of lost track. Every once in a while, I talk to his dad, who's a, a friend of mine, uh, who was a friend of mine up in Omaha. But, you know, did one of those, yeah, good luck, you know, uh, let me know how things go. Anyway, uh, fast forward to 2022. Um, we're getting ready for Oshkosh. Uh, I participate heavily for NAFI uh, at the show. And I got a text message from Chris saying, are you going to be at the show? I responded, yeah. Why? I'll be there all week. Why? And he said, yay, my family and I will be there. I'm the demonstrator pilot in the Osprey. Okay, smokes. Wow, cool. Great. That's really neat. And I got, he, they, he showed up uh, for their demo flights and they, um, I'm, they did try to get me, get a waiver to get me in the Osprey. Uh, no, <laughs> the Marines weren't having that, but, um, uh, I did get a, a VIP tour of the aircraft and so on. And I saw his, uh, Chris's dad and met Chris's uh, wife and kids for the first time and all that. It was a great moment. The next thing I knew is Chris's dad took me aside and said, you changed Chris's life. I said, what are you talking about? Well, he taught him to fly. I said, well, yeah, I taught him to fly, but he did the heavy lifting. He was, he's, he's the pilot. All I did is instruct. He says, Bob, you don't get it. Do you remember the speech that you gave him when he was in high school? I said, what speech? Well, you said you wouldn't teach. If his grades started to slip in school, you'd stop training him because he had to get into college. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, I say that to all high school kids because this, is, this can be addicting and distracting. And he said, you don't know, Bob, but at the time, Chris was in serious trouble at school and getting into a bad element. And then... This is out on the ramp at Oshkosh, by the way, uh, at the at the Forum Square. And he said, you saved his life. And I looked at uh, Steve Lazarus, Chris's dad, and I said, USOB, not in those words, but USOB, you can't make me cry in front of a bunch of Marines, which he did. That's the story in a nutshell. And Chris and Steve for the article gave some really good insights as to the process and what they saw. And I'm not going to even attempt to paraphrase what they had to say. Anyway, I told you, uh, Beth, about the story. And you said, wow, great story. And there it languished. <laughs> and it was a, it was the, it was the, um, I'm trying to, <laughs> It was the plug in the drain of everything else. I couldn't write other than routine email. Obviously, I could still write routine emails and correspondence, all that. But I couldn't write an article because this thing was in the way. And the reason it was in the way is every time I wanted to tell the story, it, it came out being all about me, or I thought it was. And this was not my story. This is Chris's story. Or maybe it was a story of all three of us as a dynamic. Until I'm not sure which one of us had the idea. I think you had the idea of inviting Chris and Steve uh, uh, to write their perspectives, to make it a three-person, uh, not a joint article, but three articles within one um, talking about this. Because, I, I, again, it's not about me uh, in this particular case. It's not about me as an instructor. It was about Chris's success. And I wanted to make sure that came through in the article. Um, yes, I certainly wanted to share how proud I was of him. And yes, the reason why I'm proud and why it's so important. And, and, I, um, and I believe I use the words in the article, uh, why it's my honor to be a flight instructor, uh, to be able to touch somebody like this. But having that article in the way because my subconscious desperately wanted to, to write this. 
wouldn't allow me to write anything else. And it's the darndest thing I've ever experienced. I don't know if other writers I didn't do know that. that. I didn't know that that this was the case, Bob. I knew you were, you know, kind of you, you would express to me because because by the way, you guys, I would like call him and email him gently poking him. But I didn't realize that um that this was keeping you from writing other things. Like this was the the one. So let me ask you a question. So you just told us that um you didn't want it to be about you. Mm -hmm. So I get that because you don't want it. You know, one of the things that we all, that is a challenge, there's this balance between I'm a freaking amazing, look at me, I'm so great, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, la, 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 and, <laughs> and hiding, mm -hmm. and, and hiding. So there, there's like a balance between yeah. those two. Those are the extremes. Now, there's a saying that I love. It's it's It goes like this. It's not pretentious if you're not pretending. So, for example, if Michael Phelps came up to you and said, I'm the best swimmer in the world, you'd be like, well, yeah, you are the best swimmer yeah. in the world. So, like, there's certain things that we can just say, like, I'm a really good flight instructor. Like, that is an ego. That is an arrogance. That is just a statement of fact. I can fully appreciate that you want you didn't want it to be me first. Mm -hmm. um, but I sometimes think that again there's this shadow of who am i to tell this story who am i it, it's almost like humbleness but um almost i'm coming up with this new term like almost a toxic humbleness because it kind of keeps you from showing your true authenticity i saw you smile what were you thinking when i said that herbert tar um uh, a really good. Uh, he only wrote a couple of books, but uh, Herbert Tarr is a rabbi who wrote a couple of books, and one of them was the conversion, uh, the conversion of Chaplain Cohen, and it's about, of all things, a rabbi, a young rabbi who went into, who had to do his military service. This is back in the fifties. Wound up in the Strategic Air Command, which is fine, uh, except he was afraid of flying. So he's a rabbi, he's a chaplain, he's an Air Force chaplain who's terrified of flying. But all the quotas for the, the other services were filled up, so guess where he wound up. Anyway, one of the characters in the book uh, at chaplain school, and I believe it was uh, one of his Protestant uh, brethren uh, at chaplain school, said that there's a syndrome in the, in the clergy. It's called, I'm the humblest person here and I'm proud of it. Uh, and you have to, I have learned, you know, David uh, taught me, uh, you have helped uh, quite a bit, that there's a difference between humility and, and what you call toxic, I'll call it the arrogance of humility. Um, you really don't want to be humble to the point uh, that you can't express yourself. And a lot of young flight instructors, a lot of inexperienced flight instructors, and a lot of experienced flight instructors, uh, it's all been said. I, I still hear myself saying it, okay? It's all been said. Nobody can write it. You know, Rod Machado said it. John and Martha King have said it. Blah, 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 blah. Pick, pick whoever you want to say. You know, Brian Ship has said it. Barry Ship has said it. Brian and Barry have said it. So on and so on and so on and so on. It's okay. If you have something to say, unless it's pure nonsense, you can pick your own adjective, unless it's pure nonsense, it's probably worth saying as long as it's articulate and isn't just for the sake of spouting something out. So you're giving me so much good stuff here, Bob. So one of my writing mentors years and years ago she was, she's an expert in procrastination and <laughs> overcoming procrastination. And one, and so she speaks to exactly what you just said, where, where, what do I have to say? Everybody's already said this. Well, who am I to say this? Her, her saying is it's all been said before, but not by you. Exactly right. You know, we all have our unique perspectives and it's all been said before, but not by you. 
So it's always original. Do you guys know that all of Shakespeare's plays, they are not original plays. He, no. he used themes and wrote on the themes. You know, you've heard that saying, there's never an original story. And, and that's that's kind of true. And I had this example one time, somebody, I don't remember where I heard this, but it's like, like writing a book about quitting smoking or writing a book about losing weight. Like that's been done a million times, but you know what? Every single friggin' day, another book on how to quit smoking and how to lose weight is published. So it's all been said before, but not by you. You have your own unique perspective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, only you could have told this story. You Only you could have told this story of this young man and his father, which by the way, Bob didn't mention this, but he was also teaching Chris's father, Steve, how to fly as well. Steve didn't go on to become a pilot, but he was teaching father and son. Um, and then the success that Chris went on to have and fly for the military and, and how you inadvertently said words that changed his life, you know, and getting chills as I'm telling you this. So only you could tell this story, Bob. And if you had kept that locked away, and if it wasn't sitting on this cover of this magazine that 7,000 plus people have seen, and we've gotten feedback about how touching this, this article was, it's a, it's a, it's a heartstring puller, you guys, if you haven't read it, go check it out. How amazing that you chose to to put this out into the world. Like that was, it was, it was an act of, I don't know, it was like you overcame a hurdle to do it. The funny thing is, and I, I know you were going to talk about the process of writing somewhere in here, but I'll say this is that once, once I got over the hump, it took me it took me 30 minutes to write it. What? 30 it minutes. <laughs> three, zero minutes. I'm a fast typer. Fast typist. Um, <laughs> you're the editor. You tell me which, which is right, typist or typer. But anyway, I am I can type. And as soon as I got the first word down, literally, I couldn't stop for 30, 35 minutes straight. And that's what you got as a ma as a manuscript. So, okay, you just said, what were the words you used once I got over the hump or once I got over the hurdle? Once I got over the hump. Once the first word got up on the screen. By the way, I grew up in the age era of typewriters. Um, I'm not a Tom Hanks. I don't collect them. But um, um, everybody said, writers in the old days said the most evil thing in the world was a um sheet of white paper and a typewriter? No, that's not true, uh, because I, run, I, I span, span the uh, technology. The most evil thing in the world is a flashing cursor on a white screen. That That's horrible to look at. Anyway, uh, once I got the, the first, I don't even remember what the first sentence was in the, in the article, to be honest with you, but uh, once I got the first word down on paper, it just rolled. So let me ask you a question, Bob. Mm -hmm. What do you define... Tell us what the hurdle was. You said, once I got over the hurdle, and you've already touched on what the hurdle might have been. The first sentence, I will tell you guys, because I just pulled the magazine up. The first sentence is, teaching others to fly is personal to me. That was his oh. first sentence. So, and, and so how do you define the hurdle? The hurdle, it, it, it depends on the article. Um, in this particular case, it was the emotional hurdle of I didn't want to be selfish. I didn't want to appear selfish, and I didn't want to be selfish. Um, and there are two distinct things when I say that. You can be as selfless as you want to be in the world and still look like you're a greedy person, okay? Uh, just inadvertently. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to appear that I was trotting my ego out for the whole world to see. And at the same time, I didn't want to trot out my ego for the whole world to see. Now, it sounds like it's the same thing, but it really isn't. It's two different things entirely. It's how you phrase things. Words do really do matter, folks. And um, so the hurdle in this particular case was making sure that I had the right, the right tone. And those long conversations you and I had had about the article, and this is where an editor is, or an editor or friend, and in, in, in this case, it's both, 
is very helpful because I kept poking at this story from different angles, looking for a way out of the box that I was in. And, um, you know, whoever you want to, whoever you want to use for that process, it's, it's okay. A friend, sometimes my wife has done this. In this case, my wife actually looked at me and said, why don't you just write the silly thing? You know, and she wasn't being mean about it. She just, she just couldn't understand the block. Uh, Beth was very patient with me about this one. And in any case, in this case, the, the hurdle was setting the right tone and knowing where I was going to take the thread of the of the story, the narrative. Because this was a story. This wasn't a, a fact-driven article. This was this was an emotionally driven piece. And so I wanted I wanted to um, get. Uh, if you imagine the process is like crossing a river and where you want to end up on the other side of the river. Um, this was a process of, okay, I want to be over there when I'm done. And how do I, how do I thread through the, uh, well, I'm waxing poetic today, today, aren't I? How do I thread through the shoals and the rapids and all that of this river? Because I don't want to get swept downstream by it. I don't okay? think it was the wordsmith. What's that? Ah, well, then thanks. Anyway, so basically, how do I, how do I get there from here? is what what it, what it was really about. Uh, that was a hurdle. And again, that first sentence broke the logjam. When I realized, okay, the whole theme, this is personal. I can't help it. This is a personal story. There's nothing I can do about this. It's not, it's not, it's not describing angle of attack or something coldly scientific. Okay. Right. And, um, Okay, first off, you've given me a good segue into the process of writing. So, but before we get there, I just want to point out to our listeners, you may have noticed in Mentor Magazine, we have lots of different types of articles. We do have how-to articles, factual articles. We also have personal interest stories and inspiration stories. Um, so it's, it's a mixed bag and in each edition of Mentor, I try to have a combination of those stories because it's sort of like, I don't know, you're listening to piano and then you listen to violin and then you listen to, you know what I mean? It's like sort of shifting it around a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of mix it, mixes it up. Cause I'm sure everyone has had a, especially if you read um, like technical writing where it can get kind of dry if everything you read is just some sort of technical thing. So um it's nice to have the human interest stories. And I've gotten feedback from NAFI members that they really do appreciate those types of stories. And it seems like I tend to put those stories on the cover, the human interest stories to go on the cover. I think because they are very, um, it's not just about flying. So, okay, the story is about you taught this guy how to fly. But it's this, you guys, this goes more than just aviation. This is like human potential, uh, being a mentor of any type, um, of showing up for someone, believing in them, of, of it's, it speaks to our humanness and, and our supporting of each other. Well, remember what, what uh, uh, Paul po Poverezny said uh, in his speech, what, 2001 something at, at AirVenture? Um, he said, you know, without people, all these things are just statues. All these airplanes are just pieces of metal and wooden fabric. Uh, sitting on the ramp. They don't mean anything. Not, nothing means anything uh, in our lives uh, as social human beings if we don't interact with each other. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I, I love to fly. There's one thing more I think every pilot loves more than, than flying. It's talking about flying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the ratio of coffee drinking to flight hours is probably one and a half to one, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, so anyway. So, and also, well, I will just jump in here and say, uh, Bob still on occasion does write for eMentor. So, you know, Karen is on the hook for every single week, but she does get spelled sometimes by NAFI board members writing articles for eMentor. And Bob just appeared in the January 10th issue of eMentor. He wrote an article, a short article in eMentor about 
an experience he had on an airline as he was flying back from Europe about a watching an airline captain talking to a passenger in the seat next to him and just sharing that joy and enthusiasm of flight. So as flight instructors, we get to share our passion and change people's lives for the better through our flight instruction. Of course, through lots of ways. I'm sure, Bob, in your non-flight instructor world, you do lots of lifting up of people as well. Oh, thank you for that. So I want to talk a little, you sort of segued into the, the process of writing and Bob talked about how he had to get over sort of feeling like he was writing from an ego centered place, from a heart centered place. That's kind of how I'm taking it. And he said, well, it was... good. that's better than how I said it. I like that. <laughs> I just <laughs> paraphrasing as I listen, but that's kind of what it was. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, we we all have this, but again, if we don't tell our stories, if we're not telling our personal experiences and stories, like you, you're, the world is less rich for that. So hurdle number one. So when it comes to the process of writing, I have found that I don't actually know what's going to come out until I actually start writing. Some people think that they need to have the beginning, the middle, and the end in their head before they can start. That is a very common occurrence. My experience in more than a decade of professional writing is that what comes out, I, I don't know until I start writing, and I, I surprise myself sometimes. So I think there's an element in the process of writing is allowing the process to unfold in ways that you don't anticipate. Like you didn't know when you wrote that first sentence, how it was all going to come out. Like you had, you sort of had a, maybe a slight map, but you weren't sure all the twists and turns necessarily mm -hmm. were going to take. So I want to talk about that. It's like, you don't always know when you start where it's going to go. The second part is there's, there's always editing. And at least personally, like, I don't know, dude, maybe you're like friggin' Mozart who writes like a symphony, like verbatim and <laughs> like, as it comes, as it's dictated by God onto a piece of music paper. I don't know. I do not. That is not my process. My process is <laughs> write a shitty first draft. That's what Anne Lamott calls it. She calls it the shitty first draft. And then you look at it and you vomit in your mouth and you throw it away and you say, I suck as a writer and I'm never going to write again. And then you go back and you edit the crap out of it. And then after that process, which goes over and over and over, then you have this like beautiful piece of work that exists in the world. At least that's been my experience. Well, let me, let me share and with the audience here that everybody has a different style. Uh, one of my favorite authors, not just for science fiction, but for his general writing, was uh, was Isaac Asimov. Or is. He's passed away, so I'm not sure what tense to use here. But anyway, he... Um, and he always talked about... He sat down at, at his typewriter or word processor, and it just came out. And he was a one-draft writer. He, uh, he, he would get edited... But it was all it was by his editors, but he was rarely rewrote. That's okay. You have a style where you write and re-edit yourself. That's okay too. I think the big problem with a lot of people wanting to write, especially for a magazine that is, I think is prestigious, and we're proud of it, um, that has impact, is along with the imposter syndrome issues that we all get. There's this idea that there has to be a structure. When you write an article, it's not a theme. Okay? Nor is it necessarily, even though there's a lesson involved, it is not a lesson in front of a bunch of students. It is a story. Even if it's a fact-driven, something as dry as dust as this is how you build a wing. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's still... A story that you're telling. We come out of uh, high school and college with this whole process of have have a, have to have an outline. One, two, three. If you have a one, you have to have a two. If you have an A, you have to have a B, and on and on and on and on. And I've tried writing articles like that. Me personally, now, if it works for you, great. I can't write like that. I can't have that kind of structure. 
I sit down and, and, and it depends and it really depends on where I'm coming from. Sometimes I write from the end backwards. Now, that doesn't mean I'm typing words. and say, I can't think that way, okay? I can't write that way. I'm not, you know, I don't, write, I don't write the concluding sentence and then build sentences on top of it. But I know darn well what my point is at the very end. Uh, let's take something as simple as a safety-related article. There's clearly going to be a, a message at the end that says something like, thou shalt not fly a 172 into freezing rain. That's the message, okay? Just to take a simple article now and you've asked me for 450 intelligent words about that okay now i got a goal for the number of words succinct but not too not too brief i know i want to say don't be stupid with an airplane okay don't be an idiot so now I'm, I'm writing now i've got to backfill all the way back to the first sentence and say okay how am i going to start this off because i know where i want to end up it's like telling a joke. I know what the punchline is. Now I got to do the buildup. And the buildup can't telegraph the joke necessarily. Okay. Can't telegraph the punchline because you'll lose the impact. But it's got to be a logical order to get to the end. Okay. That's one, that's one version of, of something that I've written. Other times I've sat down and said, as you just said, hmm, I have something to say, but I don't know how to say it yet. Let's go. Let's start as as I'm speaking right now. I'm not sure where I'm going to end this 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 whole paragraph that I'm giving you, or several paragraphs. But I know I know there's something important that I'm saying, and I'll know when I get to the end when to stop talking, like right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. It, it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, as far as one point I do want to make, I don't re-edit myself. I rarely go back and re-hack. It's not a hack. I, I apologize. I, for my own writing, if I find if I play with it, it's like chasing that. It's like chasing the bubble in the corner in the wallpaper in the top left corner of the of the bedroom. <laughs> you try to fix it, and you've screwed up the whole room. Okay, I can't. I that's me. Other people are re-editors. That's fine. I edit on the fly. I read it and go, well, no, I'll pick up. I'll, that's why I love uh, Word instead of a typewriter, because I'll pick up the sentence. Okay, this fits better down here. I might re-edit or move a paragraph or something like that. But generally speaking, I leave it to pros like you and David. Every once in a while, David will come back to me and, said, and say, your third paragraph is really your second paragraph, Bob. And I'll say, oh, you're right. Yeah, stream of consciousness. Sorry about that. Or you made a hard left here on this sentence. And it doesn't really fit. I know you want to say it because it's funny and it's cute and all this other stuff. But it doesn't belong. And I have to be willing to accept that and say, yeah, you're right. You know, you know, cold clinical eyes four days later. Yeah, you're right. Take it out. Well, it's interesting that you bring up this point of like editing. And I was actually just having this conversation with Heather Spaulding, uh, with Nafi. Um, I said to her, we were having a conversation about some content and I said, nothing has ever been, nothing has ever been improved by saying more than needs to be said. Right. Editing and cutting always produces a better, tighter, product. I believe it was Mark Twain who said, I didn't have the time to write you a short letter. So I wrote you a long one instead. <laughs> I didn't know that quote. I like that. Yeah. So um, writing less is harder than writing more because you have to make each word and each sentence count. And a lot of what we all write, every single writer, some of it is superfluous. Some of it is a little out of left field and some of it like you really want to keep in there. But if you have 1200 words, you got to you got to take out the extra 100 or 200 words. It just like you literally can't put it in there. And, um, you know, when you think about like a magazine, only so many words fit on a page 700, by the way. But even if you have unlimited pixels on a, a computer screen, less is always more like because mm -hmm. it distills your the essence more, uh, more 
it, it concentrates it and it's more impactful. It would be like if you had a perfume that was like, if you distill it down, you'll, you'll, you'll smell the scent better. Same. How's that for an analogy? Um, <laughs> do you agree, Bob? I'll, I'll take that analogy. The other one I'll use is all of you that are watching this are ex experienced flight instructors or even new ones. You've done your PowerPoints or your whiteboard presentations and you hear yourself, you know, when you're talking too much. Okay. And you stop. In the case of writing, I literally hear myself talking as I type. Mm -hmm. I don't talk out loud while I type. By the way, I cannot write on a legal pad. Got to be a type. It's got to be typing. But um, I can hear the run-on sentence or the run-on thought as I'm typing. So, yeah, that's where the backspace key comes in. Um, you and David uh, have been very complimentary. You... Very few times have you have I seen. Uh, I'm lucky, I think, uh, because very few times have you guys had to hack out chunks of what I've written. Um, every once in a while, every once in a while, uh, what's I think what really happens more with me is something that I think is perfectly logical in my head. Uh, something like, "Well, I'm at A, so D happens." Well, wait a minute, where's B and C? Okay, how did you get there? Oh, yeah, maybe I ought to explain that. Well, it's clear to me, isn't it? Why isn't it clear to you? Well, because you're the one who wrote it, Bob. So anyway, that's my that's where I get jazzed up. But listen to yourself as, as you write the article, whether, however you write it, whether you scribble it in longhand or you type it or you chisel it into a stone. I don't, I don't care. Listen to what you're saying as you, as you do it. Use that outside ear so to speak, to give yourself feedback as you're going. It's funny. Um, well, as we wrap up this podcast episode, you guys, you know, normally towards the end of the podcast, I say to the guest, so do you have any advice or input for people who are considering writing for mentor? But basically this entire podcast, that's what we talked about. No, I do have advice. Okay, go for it. I do have advice. First of all, um, Beth needs content. <laughs> right. Please write. Hey, Bob, he's plugging me. <laughs> <laughs> Please write. I don't care how experienced or inexperienced any of you are. If you're a brand new flight instructor and your the temporary is leaving ink smudges on, on the back of your driver's license, you have something to say. Talk to us about, talk, remind us old folks us gray-haired people, what it was like to become a new CFI, if that's what it takes. That's your story, okay? Or write about how you feel wet behind the ears, or I don't care. It doesn't matter. You have something to say. You don't know you have something to say. Beth alluded to it at the beginning. For the experienced ones, you've got a million stories you just don't know about it. If you talk about an experience over coffee at the hangar as you're stealing the FBO's coffee, and donuts on a Saturday morning, you have an article. If you think 1,200 words is a lot, think about, I want you to go out and have somebody do a transcript of this podcast. <laughs> and I'd say what, we probably, between the two of us, what, about four or 5,000 words easily? I Something like that, probably more. Somewhere in there. It, it is not hard to get to 1,200 words. I will tell you that sometimes when I'm given a hard stop by Beth or in days past David, I'll be watching that word counter down on the lower, lower left going, ooh, I got to think of a better way to say this. Well, um, and just let me, let me just pause. Let me just pause you. It doesn't have to be 1,200 words. I have people okay. submit everything from 700, which is a one word, one page article to 2,500. So anyway, it, it, I always tell people, tell the story, like yeah. as many words yeah. to tell the story. Unless, for example, I say, dude, it needs to stay to a page and a half. Like, so. And with experience. The other thing, just like flying, David used to say this, and Beth, you've said it in a different way. David would compliment me and say, your writing's gotten really good over the years. And I went, like, thank you very much. But I can't see any difference. Well, you have no idea. You've been practicing it so much, you don't know. You know, all those articles I wrote. With practice, you will hit your targets. It's just like flying an ILS, okay, or hitting that spot on the runway. 
you will hit it without even trying. If there's if there's a, you know, but you can't do it without practice. You can't do an accuracy landing the very first time. Well, unless you're lucky, you can't do an accuracy landing well the very first time out of the box, right? That's why we teach students in practice. It's the same thing with writing. You cannot write well unless you do a lot of it. And it becomes easy. Yes, it's burdensome at first, and you tend to talk too much like I'm doing right now. But at the back end, at the back end, um, or worse yet, you don't say enough. Um, but at the back end, it becomes very, very simple. The process, once you get comfortable with your own style, don't try to ape somebody else's style. Be you. And if nothing else, write it as it comes out of your brain. And a really good editor like Beth, and in days past, David, to give him his due, will help you structure the story. And you'll learn the structure. And you'll learn how to fix your fix the process as you go. I love what you've said, several things. One is just, you got to start. You have to just start. Um, I have to tell you, a friend of mine got me this calendar. It, it has a lot of F words in it. It's like an effing 2024 calendar. And January 3rd, I saved, I should save it. I saved the picture, but I would have to block out one of the words. It said, start by effing starting. Like that was January 3rd. And I love that. I took a picture and kept it. So yeah, you have to start by effing starting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there's that. And it, there's a leap of faith. Like Bob said, after that hurdle to sit down and start, it is a leap of faith. And I, I think it's like getting to that place is the hardest, like getting over yourself and sitting down. Um, the other thing is, I'm glad you brought up the editor's role in, in creating a polished piece of content. David Hipschman, who we've been referring to, David is a uh, very, David you are, I couldn't be where I am today without you. He's an incredible mentor. Like, I can't tell you how much this man has helped me. And uh, he said, Shakespeare needed a copy editor. Everyone needs an editor. Everyone huh. needs an editor. So I don't care how good a writer you are, you need an editor. And the draft that you submit to me, we will polish it, whether it means rearranging a little bit of the sentence structure or punctuation that's like nuts and bolts stuff but we will polish it and when it goes out to the world it's beautiful so you guys don't worry that it has to be perfect again perfectionistic tendencies oh, i can't give it to beth unless it's perfect no we will get it polished and perfect so go, go ahead sorry i was just going to say don't forget stanley kubrick cut 19 minutes out of 2001 after the after the first showing I didn't know that. Really. You know, you know, I mean, you know, talk about a perfectionist, right? So. So, well, is, you know, and you, the e-mentor that you sent to me for January 10th was a little bit too long. And I cut a whole paragraph off the top. Yep. You know, that's just, it's, it's just part of the, part of the process. But. And, 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 and it was a paragraph I really enjoyed writing. Right. It, was a, it was a great little story. And you know, what's neat about that story's not gone. I'll use it somewhere else. Well, and that's the beauty, you guys. When you take things out, it's not that it's bad. It's not that it's good. Like you said, it's a great story. I enjoyed the story too. There just wasn't space in the container for it. And so that's another good point. Content is never wasted. If you wrote something and it couldn't be used for whatever reason, it's still, you created it. It's still in your back pocket. You can pull it out at another, like when Bob writes his autobiography, he can put that part in there. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, Bob, this this has been, you know, you guys, again, this is a little bit, um, we're giving you a little bit about sort of, uh, you know, when, when you get the, the, the magazine and it's like full color and all the things and all the pictures and all this stuff. And I just look at it and I think of like all of the, it didn't start out this way. It started out with an email from somebody in a word document and it went back and forth multi- times with editing and then it goes to the layout designer and then it is so it's I feel proud like it's like a baby <laughs> you know what I mean each month yeah. I'm like so happy to see it it's just you like do, so, and you're doing a great job thank and you we uh, yeah. well and I couldn't do my job without you guys like literally if you guys didn't give me content we wouldn't have a magazine oh. so oh, maybe. can you hold up the magazine one more time sure okay one more this is a bit of a brag this is my ego trotting out 
Um, I know what he's going to say. The other content that Beth needs is good pictures. The pictures for the article are I shot. Yeah, Bob Bob took this picture at Oshkosh and it's it's fabulous. So yeah, so you know, you don't have to submit pictures, but if you have them, that's always great. Um, Bob, this has been so again, you guys, this has been a little bit of a different podcast because we've talked a little bit about sort of the human part that goes into creating anything that is created. There's people behind it with their doubts and their fears and their imperfections. But we wanted to show this to you and to say, like, if we could do it, you could, you could do it. And um, also, I'm always here. Actually, I'm having a call tomorrow with a NAFI member who reached out to me earlier this week and said, hey, I want to write for Mentor. But he goes, this was really funny. He said, um, he goes, if my English teacher knew that I was reaching out to offer to write for, for this magazine, they would probably advise you to delete this email and move on before. So I thought that was really funny, but I'm going to have a conversation with him tomorrow about like, it's all about growth. Yeah. What what do you want to write about? What do you want? What stories do you want to tell? So we're going to have in the way, this is what I do with folks. When you reach out to me, I will call you and we'll have a conversation about like, what are you want to write about and what are the angles and how could we make this happen? So it's not like you will have support. Yeah. One more thing I want to bring up, and I'm glad you brought this up. And I know you're trying to get to a, get to an end on this, but the, I think this is important. No, what I was doing on deadline, by the way, deadlines for me are a good thing. Um, I don't know about other people, but you don't tell me you can do it next week. Tell me you need it like five minutes ago. Uh, that's just my way of writing. But uh, for um, for those of you, if if you don't know what you're going to write, and let's face it, there'd be Fridays that I'd be I got to write something for eMentor. Otherwise, Dave. Otherwise, Dave's going to put it out. This page intentionally left blank, and with my name on it. It's okay to kick it around with other people. It's okay to kick it around with the editor. A lot of a lot of credit goes to Beth and to David for picking my brain and others saying, what do you want to talk? You just said, what do you want to talk about? You know, if you come up and say, I don't know what to say. You always got something to say, Bob. You just don't know it. Let's go over a few things. And all of a sudden something will resonate and you go. So if it's whether you talk to an editor or a friend or whatever, if you're trying to come up with an idea, it's okay. You know, it's not an insular task. It's not, it's not cheating to ask for a little help. Just it's, like it's not, it's not just like it's not cheating to look in the far end. Good point. Yeah, it, this is this is a this is a team sport, not a solitary. Yes, you, yeah. you know, writing seems like a very solitary endeavor, and it can be, but we are here to help support you. So, Bob, this has been a fabulous conversation. I knew this was going to be really fun to chat with you. I don't have a lot of people that I can talk writing about, so it kind of, it's kind of fun to nerd out with you. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do this off the podcast and have conversations. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. For your, thank you for your service to NAFI for, for all those years as board chair, continuing to serve as chair um, as a board member. Um, Bob is an integral part of many of NAFI's outreach events like uh, Air Venture, the NAFI Summit. He's written articles. He wrote the recap uh, NAFI Summit article. So he continues to write and to support NAFI. And thank you so much for your service, Bob. Well, thank you very much. And that's that's very kind of you. I appreciate it. Well, you guys, thank you for joining us for the Writers Behind the Stories on NAFI's More Right Writer podcast. Be sure to leave your comments, like, subscribe, and join me next time in a couple of months. I invite you to share your stories in Mentor Magazine, and we'll see you next time on the Writers Behind the Stories on NAFI's More Right Writer podcast.